Hey all and welcome back to another awesome tutorial video and this is one of my favourite builds so far. It's packed full of tips, tricks and techniques so you too can create an amazing subway scene that will amaze all onlookers. So sit back, relax and enjoy watching this project come to life. And this video is sponsored by NordVPN. As with all my projects they all start with a solid base. I use some 7mm thick plywood from the hardware store on this build along with some 42 by 19 mm pine to brace it. Overall the length of this model is 1.2 meters long. After placing the track and the trains on the base, I got an idea of how wide I wanted the station to be. I was careful to make sure that with the train on the track there were no parts of the train extending over the outer edge of the model. Once I was happy the track placement is marked and while the train is still in place I also mark the edge of the train so that I know how far the platform needs to be. The same is done on both sides. Now the base can be cut and constructed. The difference with this particular model is that not only will I need the base but I'll also need to build the rear wall and roof using the same techniques as done with the base. So once I know how high the roof will be by measuring the maximum height of the train, I constructed the rest of the frame. The only difference was the roof used 3mm plywood instead of 7mm, and the rear wall had some 7mm spaces added, so I could add additional detail to the rear wall without reducing the total width of the station that had already been built. The whole frame is connected using bolts. That way I can fully assemble the frame to make sure everything fits together correctly. I can then disassemble it again so I can construct each section separately. The bolts will also help keep the frame nice and secure. You know what's not very secure? An empty subway station. You never know who's secretly spying on you while you sit there quietly looking at your phone, but at least your online privacy can be safe with today's sponsor NordVPN. NordVPN, which stands for Virtual Private Network, means you can surf the web anonymously, your location stays private, and your data is encrypted. They are the best because they have super fast servers in thousands of locations across the globe, and they also have Apple and Android apps, making it super easy to connect to the internet privately from anywhere in the world. And as a bonus, you can access geographically blocked content with the click of a button. As you can probably tell, I really enjoy watching model train related TV shows, but sometimes this happens, and it's really frustrating. But with NordVPN, all I have to do is set my location to the UK and BAM, I've got two full seasons of the great model railway challenge that I can binge on. To get NordVPN on a 3 year plan with 70% off, be sure to go to nordvpn.com slash and if you use the link in the description or the promo code TOWEN at checkout, they'll know I sent you and they'll give you two extra months for free. That's nordvpn.com slash TOWEN. While the frame is together, I also cut out the station ends with some leftover 7mm plywood. These will eventually screw onto the ends once the main station is fully completed. Now with the frame complete, we can start on the fun stuff. The track is Pico Code 83 Flex Track. One piece isn't quite enough to span the station, so two pieces are connected so that it covers the length of the station. Excess is removed, with just a little bit left over that we will trim later. To ensure good electrical conductivity, I solder the two sections together. Just make sure to solder the outer edges of the track so that it doesn't interfere with the train wheel flanges. The track is simply fixed down with regular wood glue doing my best to make sure it's perfectly straight. I also make sure to add extra tyres where the track was soldered and finally I use the roof and place it over the track weighing it down as the glue dries. Now we can tidy up the overhanging sections of track with the Dremel. This leaves us with very clean edges so we can add extra sections of track later when we drive the train through the scene. To get a more realistic looking track, I used cork that was about the same height as the track tyres. Thin strips were added on both sides and glued with wood glue. The width of each strip also took into account how wide I wanted the bottom section of the platform to be as this would eventually be glued onto the plywood base. 
Now I can use some Woodland Scenics Smoother to fill in the gaps between the tyres. It gets mixed quite thin and spread out across the track. I continue to spread it with my fingers as it begins to set and I make sure to remove the excess from the edges of the rail. After a few hours and once it has completely dried, I peel up the mask and use a fine 360 grit sandpaper to smooth out any imperfections. Next, some Rust-Oleum Charcoal Ultra Matte Paint is applied to seal the plaster and to help hide any unwanted white spots later. The paint that ends up on top of the rails is removed using some isopropyl alcohol, a paper towel and a small square of the PVC foam board to scrape away the excess. To build the platform, I used a 15mm foam sheet and my homemade hot wire foam cutter. A test piece was cut first just to make sure it was perfect. Once I was sure it would fit, I cut the main piece. It was then lined with 3mm PVC foam board. Strips are cut making sure to get them perfectly straight. I found that using a straight aluminium tube that gets clamped to the bench not only helps get a straight line, but it also helps me align the blade of the knife perfectly vertical, giving me a perfect cut every time. Also, don't forget to remove the protective plastic before gluing it to the foam base. Here you can see each edge of the platform is lined with PVC foam and the platform is test fitted before gluing just to make sure the train actually fits with the platform in place. Polyurethane glue is used to adhere the foams together. Only a thin layer is needed for this glue to work. Once it dries it's very strong, so make sure the parts are perfectly aligned together before leaving it to set. Just remember the glue expands as it cures, so you'll need to weigh it down as it dries. While that's drying, I can start on the platform texture. I decided to use some freezer paper and quilter's cotton to print on. There are a lot of steps in the process, but I needed something with no reflection, so this seemed like the way to go. Using the iron, I remove any creases from the cotton. And with the freezer paper cut to size, I place it down with the slightly textured side facing the cotton. It has a rough waxy surface on one side that will stick to the cotton. In order for it to be printed on, I need to cut it to A4 size. I used a piece of printer paper as a guide and cut out enough sheets to cover the entire platform. Using a very sharp hobby knife is recommended so you avoid any loose strands that could potentially interfere with the printer. As for the texture, I purchased a brick tile texture that I imported into Photoshop. I was then able to duplicate the tile enough times to get the desired platform width with a little bit of overhang. I also added some edge detail and made some color adjustments to get the desired look I was after. Then it was simply a matter of sending the design to the printer. Printing is straightforward, I just load one sheet at a time. When selecting the type of paper in the print settings, I chose matte photo paper and it seemed to work well and most of the detail was retained on the fabric. As you can see, printing on fabric, there are fine fibers across the surface of the print. These are easily removed by very rapidly waving a soldering torch flame over the surface and just make sure not to hold it in one spot for too long as you will certainly burn the fabric. You can see how much of a difference there is after using the torch. Don't worry if you do accidentally burn a spot, it just looks like a bit of weathering anyway. While the fabric is still on the freezer paper, I apply a coat of Krylon Preserve It. It's only a thin coat. This layer helps lock the cotton fibers together, preventing them from being stretched once the baking paper has been removed. Then once it's dry, you may need to give it a once over with some 400 grit sandpaper and a second pass with the torch. To be honest, you could probably skip this step as it didn't make much of a difference. Now the backing paper is removed and the same is done to the back of the cotton. And then it's left to dry. Once dry, the excess is trimmed away. 
Before gluing it to the platform base, I roughen the base with some 180 grit sandpaper so the glue gets a good grip on the foam. The glue I'm using is 3M Super 77 spray adhesive as it seems to do well on a wide variety of materials. The most important step is getting the first piece down straight. So be sure to really take your time with the first piece because the other pieces will fit perfectly provided the first one is spot on. Then it's just a matter of taking it one step at a time. Each piece is pressed up against the last until the entire platform has been covered. Excess is trimmed away with a sharp hobby knife. Given the fabric is all locked together with the Krylon spray it, it's surprisingly easy to cut. Any edges like these white lines between each sheet are hidden with a small amount of appropriately coloured paint. The colour will just depend on the type of brick you use, it doesn't have to be perfect. Anything will look better than the glaringly obvious white lines. As for the platform edge, I painted it a cement colour using some of the light grey to add variation. Deck tan was used along the edge of the platform. Some weathering effects like dirt and grime will be added later. Additional detail was also added for a bit of interest along the base of the platform using the chopper to help make multiple cuts all the same length. To attach the platform to the base I'm using more of the Gorilla Glue, remembering to weigh it down as the glue cures. With the platform base done I can move on to the back wall. The PVC foam ball works really well as the base material. Strips of PVC were cut to length and I beveled the back edge so it would sit flush against the plywood. It gets fixed in position with two part quick setting epoxy and then pressed into position. The epoxy sets quite fast but you may need to use something to help hold it in the right spot as the epoxy hardens. Some 4mm styrene tube was also added along the rear wall for a bit of visual interest and it's also fixed with epoxy. And then finally the top section of wall is added with a spacing strip at the top edge so that it will sit on a slight angle. Any excess epoxy can be removed with a paper towel soaked in isopropyl alcohol, as long as you remove it before it begins to harden. A flat wall isn't that interesting, so after measuring the sections of wall I use some 0.5mm styrene sheet and the duplicate it to cut out small panels to add along the length of the back wall. It was a time consuming process, but I think it was certainly worth adding. It adds some depth to the scene. Fast drying super glue was used to adhere the panels to the wall and a 0.5mm piece of styrene was used as a spacer so it would get an even and consistent space between each of the panels. For the bottom panels, I fashioned the spacer so it would help line up the lower panels with the panels already glued along the top of the wall. Once it's all assembled, we can paint it. I used Tamiya white primer for the base coat. This coat is then followed with some scale modeler supply insignia white, which is a nice dirty white perfect for an underground subway station. As with any paint, you want to make sure it's thoroughly mixed before use. It's hard to see on camera, but it is being applied. Again, to help add depth, I painted the styrene tube a different color. A little tip when painting with a brush. To help hold my hand steady and get a straight line, you'll notice I'm using my other hand to help guide the brush while also bracing that hand on the table. This not only helps me get a straight line, but it also helps the brush not shake, leaving an uneven line. Additionally, every sixth panel was painted a different colour. The colour of choice was a faded grey-blue. I didn't have the exact colour, but mixing a ratio of two parts Vallejo white and one part Vallejo grey-blue gave me a nice dull blue. I make sure to carefully mask the panels, so paint is only applied in the desired locations. 
To avoid having the paint run under the mask, I make sure to only apply very light thin layers. Once the first layer is almost dry, add a second layer and repeat the process until I get good even coverage. Lastly, the wall needs weathering. This is done with some Vallejo Radome Tan, Sand Yellow and German Black Brown. I start with the lightest colour first, applying the colour around the edge of each individual panel. It's only a very light layer creating a vignette of dust. The second layer, Sand Yellow, is applied next in a similar fashion, focusing mostly on the top and bottom of the wall and around the blue panels. Then lastly, the Black Brown is applied mostly along the base of the wall with a very light misting across the top edge. The same three-step process is also applied to the base of the platform as well as the train track. This project includes quite a lot of 3D printed details and for this project I'm using the awesome Elfin 3D printer that was sent to me from Nova 3D. It's one of the easiest printers I've used so far. It auto levels making it very easy to set up and use. Simply use the supplied software to prepare the model, load it into the machine and print. For this round of printing I used Tinkercad to create some internal roof supports to hold the parts that make up the roof at just the perfect angle. Like with all resin prints, the parts will need to be washed in alcohol to remove excess resin. I used the airbrush to speed up the drying process, then they are placed under the UV light to further cure for about 30 minutes. These parts won't be visible so I'm not too concerned about removing the support material too cleanly. I even left some of it attached to the supports. Strips of PVC foam board are used to build up the roof structure. Similar to the platform, I use some aluminium tube as a guide again to get a perfectly straight cut. Each of the roof supports are glued evenly spaced along one strip of the PVC foam board using epoxy. It's not vital that they are perfectly spaced, however it is important that each one is flush with the bottom edge of the foam board. Using the square helps me ensure that they sit perfectly flush. Because there will be lights along this section of the roof, I bevel the edge to allow more light to come through. It's hard to see now, but once the rest of the structure is assembled, it'll make more sense. The edge of the roof structure needs to be perfectly flat, so to ensure that it is flat, I fashioned up a jig to help sand it perfectly along the entire edge. To create the lights, I use some plastic sheet that has a frosted look. Strips are cut to fit perfectly along the edge of the roof structure which is sanded flat. I use Helmar SuperTac glue for this and you'll want to avoid getting glue towards the middle of the strip as this will be where the light will shine through. Now this can be glued onto the roof frame of the diorama. Again, I'm simply using tacky glue to hold all of this in place. And just as I did with the side wall, using strips of 0.5mm styrene, I do exactly the same thing with the roof as well. Using the duplicator to cut literally hundreds of pieces the same width. A jig is used again to space the panels, although the shape is a little more complex, it still serves the same job. Before I adhere any of the panels, I make sure to fill in any gaps with some glue. Once the glue is dry, I paint over a layer of black paint to help act as a light block, preventing any light from bleeding through the gaps later. Then it's just a matter of taking it one panel at a time until the desired area is covered. It's time consuming, but the effort is certainly worth it later. Some panels may not be perfectly flush with the top, so some sanding may be required. One of the standout structures is the escalator. This was also designed in Tinkercad and 3D printed on the Alphan 3D printer. Once the support material is removed, some tidy up was required. Resin sands very well, so it's very easy to sand and prepare the model for painting. 
Because the escalator was too big to print in one piece, I had to split the model in two for printing, and then the two parts were glued together with some super glue. Zip Kicker is very useful to speed up the curing process. For the clear glass panels, I used some clear plastic packaging I had lying around. It's very thin, probably about 0.2 millimeters, but rigid enough to do the job. The desired shape is measured onto the packaging, using an ice cream stick as a guide, and then it is cut out. If needed, the permanent marker can be cleaned off with some isopropyl alcohol. Painting is straightforward. It was primed with some Tamiya light gray, followed with a layer of Vallejo metallic steel. The metallic colors have great coverage, so you shouldn't need too much, especially with the gray undercoat. For a bit of extra detail, the edge of each step had a yellow line painted for safety. The steps had an oil wash added as well. That was made using MIG black, oil brusher and some enamel thinners. Again, not a lot is needed to get a nice looking effect. Before I attach the glass, I make sure to scribe in a line along the plastic to make individual panels visible. Tacky glue is applied along each of the panels as they get fixed to the escalator steps. The rubber handrail is also added using a thin strip of styrene, 0.25 by 0.7 millimeters. In hindsight, this would have been easier to attach to the glass panels before fixing it to the steps. It was very fiddly to attach, but like most things, it was definitely worth the time and effort. The center pylons for the station were constructed using evergreen 1.6mm square tile sheet. For the more complex pylon that supports the escalator, I used paper to measure and design the shape I wanted by using the 3D printed escalator as a guide. The rest is just a matter of carefully measuring and cutting and slowly assembling the structure. For the edges, I used a hobby knife to add the tile detail to give a more seamless edge but if you have something like a wonder cutter, it certainly makes the job much faster. Machinist blocks are also great for getting things perfectly square. With everything in place, I mark the location, paying particular attention to where the escalators go. This area needs to be cut out so the escalators can fit through the roof. For the center section of the roof, I'm using some evergreen corrugated siding for some detail and texture. Strips are cut at just the right width and glued in place with super glue. More 3D details like these lights are added. The light source for these lights will be LED strip lights that will be added to the inside of the paneled sections. So once we know exactly where each light will be placed, I mark its position and drill a hole through the panel. To widen the hole, I use the Dremel with the multi-purpose cutting bit. Just make sure to hold the Dremel very tightly as we are only cutting through foam and plastic and it doesn't take much to veer off. Now it's just a matter of gluing each light fixture in place with some super glue. The lighting that runs along the length of the platform edge will also make use of the LED light strip. To highlight the individual panels, Masking tape is cut to the desired size for each light opening and stuck in place along the clear strip of plastic. Now we can start painting. Similar to earlier, to help prevent light leaking and a glowing paint effect, I lightly prime the area along the lights and then add a layer of black paint. Once that's done, the masking is removed and the rest of the roof is primed with white primer. The exact same process of painting we used for the sidewall is also used for the roof. First applying the scale modeler supply insignia white, followed with some radome tan, sand yellow and German black brown. The center pylons had an additional step added by using a wash to help bring out the tile detail. For the wash I used Vallejo black grey, heavily diluted with Vallejo airbrush thinners. It gets heavily applied to the pylon and excess is wiped off the surface using a cloth. If you find the paint has dried before being able to wipe it away, 
you can apply some airbrush thinners to the cloth and wipe away the excess. Just avoid pressing down too hard, otherwise you'll remove the paint from between the tiles as well. While I have some extra wash, I also add some to the light detail as well. Now I paint the pylons with the same step as the roof. The dark wash between the tiles acts as a pre-shade, giving a nice subtle mortar line effect without being too overpowering. In the end, I overdid it a little bit with the yellow tones, so I ended up misting over a light coat of Vallejo Off-White to help tone down the colour. The light fixtures were designed so I could use a hole punch to create the covers. It's a surprisingly nice effect and should look fantastic once the light strip is added. The masking for the long row of lights is removed and you can start to see the effect it will give. Heaps more roof detail is 3D printed. I really put the Elfin 3D printer through its paces on this project. I think I had it running every day for nearly a week with no failed prints. Well, actually there was one failed print but it was completely my fault because I didn't realize I didn't add supports and the model was just floating in midair. It was never going to work. I haven't had to adjust the bed level or do any sort of calibration. And for a printer that's less than $300, I think it's doing exceptionally well. Painting 3D printed parts is just like painting any other model. The more time you take doing a good job, the better the end result will look. These lights will be the main lighting that will provide most of the light to illuminate the platform. Once each position is marked, the Dremel is once more used to drill out the hole. I'm using Woodland Scenics Just Plug lights for most of the lights on this project. I use loads of Woodland Scenics products and these were sent to me from Hobby Headquarters who are the Woodland Scenics supplier for Australia. These are very simple to use. They have a peel and stick backing, but for good measure I add a drop of glue just to make sure. The 3D printed light fixture is test fitted to double check that it fits perfectly. Before gluing the vents in place, I add some light weathering. The 3D details were all glued down using SuperTac glue. Progress is certainly coming along. The roof and sidewall are connected and the center pylons are roughly placed in their position. The roof is then very carefully placed on top to check the pylons fit. I did my best to measure them perfectly, however a couple of them were slightly too tall, so a small amount of sanding and subsequent test fitting was needed until I had them fitting perfectly. Before gluing the pylons into their final position, I added some extra detail like some downpipes. It could be done afterwards, but adding these details now, I can easily handle the pylons freely, making this much faster and easier. The pipe connectors were all 3D printed using the Elfin 3D printer. Additional details like the platform signs and station names are also super glued in now as well. With those details added, we can now carefully measure out each location for the pylons and glue them down, ensuring they are perfectly centered. For a number of details, I combined images printed on photo paper. I can then cut and glue them as required. The photo detail certainly helps in creating a realistic scene. I use the photo paper for the TV screens, large platform signs, as well as the vending machine contents. While the roof is disconnected, I add all the extra roof details like the TV screens, exit signs and elevator signs. The platform details are also added while the roof is off. Only a small drop of tacky glue is needed and I make sure to align them accurately in the center of the platform. Random wall details like vents and electrical boxes are added for a bit of visual interest. I didn't want everything looking perfect, so I boarded up one of the elevator openings with some one millimeter birch plywood and a few pieces of strip wood that were lightly stained with India ink diluted in water. Now I can start working on the end walls. 
Once the openings for the train are cut out, I use some chooch stone wall for the detail. It's super easy to use and looks fantastic. It cuts really easily and is stuck in place using the supplied double-sided tape. Once the tape has been applied, the wall is stuck down and any overhang is trimmed free with a sharp hobby knife. Extra wall can be added by simply cutting and pressing additional strips as required and again trim away any excess. I use icy pole sticks as spacers so the rock wall would sit flush with the edge of the platform. They just happen to be the perfect thickness with the chooch stone wall. The lights that span the length of the platform are illuminated with LED strip lights. The LED strip has an adhesive backing, but I add some glue just to make sure. Once the lights are glued to the PVC foam board strip, it has some glue applied to the back and it's then inserted into the roof cavity. A quick test of the lights show how the effect will look. Every train station needs a phone. The process I use to make this phone booth model can be found in Realistic Scenery Volume 16. Now it's getting close. The roof can be attached for the final time. Just be really careful because the details are easily damaged if you're not careful. Now the ends can be glued in place and the walls screwed into position. The bolts aligning and holding everything together can be tightened. Now for the very last step, wiring all the lights together. Using the Woodland Scenics Just Plug system certainly makes this a breeze to complete. You can also add your own LEDs to the system using the right type of plug, which is how I connected the LED light strips into the Just Plug system. It's literally a plug and play type system. The most challenging part is making the wires look tidy. The control boxes can be screwed onto the back and the lights simply plug directly into the control box. Brightness can also be adjusted for each LED if needed. Once it's all connected, it looks quite organized and neat. These were sent to me from Hobby headquarters in Australia. They are the main Woodland Scenic supplier here in Australia. So for any of the Woodland Scenics range, including these lights, you'll find them at Hobby headquarters. Building a model like this is no simple task. It takes a lot of planning, preparation and patience, but once it's done, you'll have a model that will impress everyone. Future additions I'll be making to this model is a street level scene on top, and over time I'll add extra detail and effects to the subway, like rubbish on the ground, some graffiti on the walls, and some old newspapers. I hope you enjoyed watching. Please be sure to subscribe and check out my Patreon page if you enjoyed watching and would like to help support the channel. I have some perks for patrons you might like to see. And for more information about 3D printing and lots of other topics, you can also check out BoulderCreekRailroad.com. Cheers and thanks for watching.